Testing one, two, three. Grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Warm greetings on behalf of the International Ministerial Congress from the brothers who serve along beside myself. I'm delighted and honoured when Brother Regenda Sanders invited me to join you for this pastoral training seminar. I hope you're having a good time. It is my heart's desire to be with you at this time and being able to participate as we dive in deeper into the words of God, to be true saints, followers of Jesus Christ, holding on to every word of God. So I'm grateful to be able to share in this partnership. My name is John Classic. I'm married to Rebecca for the last 30 years and we have five daughters and a son and we're blessed with seven grandchildren. I live in a mud brick house here in Western Australia in the country, and I'm really blessed to see God's good work within the Church of God's Seventh Day, within this body of saints who hold on to the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus. Brothers, let's grab our Bibles and our notepads and perhaps something to drink, and we'll dive in together and look at the Word of God just a little bit more deeply and I hope we're edified and encouraged. So let's begin now in Jesus' name. Our Father in heaven, as we pause before your throne of grace, we commit to you the work of sharing the good news. Father, you knew us before the foundation of the world, and you've called us into service. You've called us into sacrificial service to love as we've been loved. And Father, we pray that your angels are around us, your Holy Spirit in us, that we may grow in the image and likeness of Jesus Christ. So everything that we say and everything we do is not our own words, not our own will, not our own purpose, but that of our Lord Jesus Christ. Bless this time together, Father, as we explore your word. And may we continue in greater strength, in greater wisdom, and in greater grace and truth. And this we ask as we open your word now. In Jesus Christ's name. Well, brothers, it's it's lovely to to get together. and It's lovely to spend time now in fellowship and exploring the words of God. And the subject of today is central to who we are. Central to everything that God has called us to. Central to the full narrative of the Holy Bible. It's the greatest mystery of all. And we read from scripture where those who preceded us, the prophets of a countless generations, longed to understand what we understand today. The Church of God's Seventh Day, we describe ourselves as a Christ-centered church. We are spirit-formed. We are Sabbath-celebrating. We are, are a distinct, unique people molded and shaped in the image and likeness of our Lord and Saviour. So brothers, let's explore the central pillar of our faith in Jesus Christ. Because through the mystery, through the scriptures, this mystery has been described in various ways. The prophets talked about it. And it's the every anchor where we build our faith. It's the answer to every desire to every longing that we could ever have. And all of us, in different ways, have different gifts and different strengths and different calling and different capacity, but the one Lord, the one faith, the one word, and the one hope and the glory that manifests itself in Jesus Christ. And the Apostle Paul left us a remarkable legacy. He says that in 1 Corinthians, he said, what I've preached... And the only thing that I know among you is two things. Jesus Christ, one, and him crucified. In other words, the life, the death, the resurrection, the ascension, the glory of Jesus Christ, and all that it means for you and me. Now, we've been called to the faith as leaders and pioneers to go and share the gospel. To, as Jesus said to Peter, feed my sheep. And we have a responsibility to rightly understand the Word of God so that everything we say and everything we do is according to His will and according to His Word. And so I want to explore the central pillar that identifies us within this faith community. We are a Christ-centered church. It's primary 
in our vision statement. It's our central claim. And I want to explore the centrality of Jesus in how it plays out and how it works with us in community and what our central message is. If you have a Bible there, you can turn to it, but I will be putting the pictures, the, the, the scriptures on the screen, and I hope they are a help to you. In Romans chapter 16, Romans chapter 16, the last book of the Ro Romans, this epic letter that Paul wrote to Jews and Gentiles who were living in Rome. Paul wanted to visit them. For various reasons, he couldn't go there. So he wrote this great letter that we are blessed to be able to have today. And he writes in verse 25 of Romans chapter 16, Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages. So Paul is referring to a mystery, a partial revelation through the prophets, that founds itself in Jesus Christ, but now has been disclosed and made known through the prophetic writings. And if you turn to Isaiah 53 and try to understand it without the Christ event, you have no idea. So what was given to Isaiah, he didn't fully understand it. He longed to understand what the prophecy was about has been made, now been made known to all nations according to the command of eternal God about the obedience of faith. Verse 27, to the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. So the entirety of scripture is one of what we call progressive revelation. From Genesis, through the Torah, through the prophets, through the writings, through the gospels, through the epistles, and finally on to Revelation, we have what I call progressive revelation. Ephesians chapter 9, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9, Paul wrote to those at Ephesus, he said, making known to us the mystery of his will. So God has a purpose and his thoughts, the Lord says, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. So in Ephesians chapter 1, Paul refers to the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ. So the Messiah, Jesus Christ, is the central pillar of this mystery, of the purpose of his will, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things in earth. And remember when Jesus was resurrected, he said to his disciples, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And therefore he commissions us based on that authority in heaven and on earth. And when Jesus prayed, he prayed as he was teaching his disciples, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it's done in heaven. So that uniting of heaven and earth, the fullness of the kingdom of God, is we are the church, the body of Christ, the kingdom in microcosm. But one day heaven and earth will be one and the Father's will will be done. A couple chapters on, Ephesians chapter 3, verses 3, Paul again talks about this mystery. How the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I've written briefly. So Paul did spend some time with the Lord, as we understand, and by revelation he came to understand and not only understand it, have a testimony, able to articulate it. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ. That verse 4 really targets it. What the prophets long to know about and see in the, in the past is now being revealed in Jesus Christ. Verse 5 of Ephesians 3, which was not made known to the sons of men in either other generations, as it's now been revealed by to his holy apostles and prophets by the Holy Spirit. See, we can't understand anything except by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit, Holy Spirit opens our mind to understand spiritual concepts and ideas and realities and the communion and the fellowship that we've been invited into. 
The mystery of Christ was not made known prior to the Christ event. Turn to, or we turn to Matthew chapter 16. And I hope you find this journey enjoyable and enlightening and encouraging as we explore the mystery of the ages, the mystery of Scripture manifest in a personal Jesus Christ, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Jesus reminds his disciples of how privileged they were to be in that time with the Messiah, the Son of God, the Son of Man on this earth. Matthew chapter 13, verse 16. Now you notice that I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Jesus says to his disciples, But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. That was the work of the Holy Spirit. They were with the Messiah, conceived of the Holy Spirit. Later on, Jesus breathes on them and says, Receive the Holy Spirit. And on the day of Pentecost, they were totally transformed by the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Verse 17 of Matthew 13. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see and did not see it. So there were prophets and there were righteous people who wondered how salvation was going to be enacted. Didn't understand it. To hear what you hear and did not hear it. So, and we are removed from those disciples now by another 2,000 years. And progressive revelation and understanding is continuing as we continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. So the disciples of Jesus' day came to understand what their forebears did not, could not understand. Colossians chapter 1, when Paul wrote to the faithful in the church at Colossae, verse 26, The mystery hidden for ages and generations but now revealed to his saints, those who keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus. The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. Verse 27, To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery. And what is this mystery? Which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's not only the mystery of Christ, but now it's the mystery of Christ in you. Remember in John, in his epistle, when he wrote to those faithful, he said, he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. The Holy Spirit allows the living Jesus to come in communion and fellowship in a very personal, powerful, covenant way. And so the mystery of the, the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, says Paul. That's our central message. That's our central pillar, Christ. Warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. And then Paul in verse 29 says, for this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. You know, Paul elsewhere says, I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. Because by ourselves, brothers, we have no strength, we have no voice, we have no authority, we have no capacity. But in Christ, with the strength that he gives, the central anchor of the Church of God's seventh day, the central anchor of the body of Christ, so we're not alone. We're not orphans. We're equipped into service. Another reference to the mystery of Christ is again in Colossians chapter 4, verse 3. He makes an appeal. And it's an appeal we often do when we ask people to pray for us. Colossians chapter 4, verse 3. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word. And this is your prayer there in Nepal. It's my prayer here in Australia and around the world. Lord God, open the door for us that we may give testimony to your word and that people can hear and that we may sow the seed of your spirit on fertile ground. Remember though, this is the Father's work. Jesus says, no one can come to me unless the Father draw him. And elsewhere in scripture, Jesus says, no one can come to the Father except through me. The oneness of the Father and the oneness of the Son together. 
that God may open to us a door for the word. And what's the word? To declare the mystery of Christ. Everything the Apostle Paul preached centered on Jesus Christ. And that's a lesson for us today, that our message must be Christ-centered. Our lives individually must be Christ-centered. As a church community, we must be Christ-centered. And Paul made requests that the door would open and the Lord would help him to speak a testimony in Jesus' name. Now, as we wonder and we work through these statements that are so clear in Scripture, let's move on to two beautiful examples that appear in Scripture that really connect the Old Testament and the New Testament, the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, the journey through Torah and the prophets with the Messiah and our journey today. And two things come to mind that are very personal, very powerful, extremely profound. The transfiguration was one, and the other one was on the road to Emmaus. Let me explain. On the figure mountain of the transfiguration, Jesus took up with him three of his closest disciples, Peter, John, and James. And while they were there in that, on that mountain, something happened. Jesus was transfigured before them into shining glory. And with him, interestingly, and take note of this, two other people, persons appeared, Moses and Elijah. Moses is the quintessential lawgiver, the, orth, the, the, the custodian of the Torah. And Elijah is the quintessential prophet. So here's the law and the prophets symbolized in Moses and Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration. And, and you'll see how the law and the prophets focus and center on Jesus Christ. Now we're given a glimpse on the Mount of Transfiguration. Matthew chapter 17. He was still speaking when behold a bright cloud overshadowed them and a voice from the cloud said, so this is Peter, John and James. There's Jesus glorified, Moses and Elijah with him. This is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. And three more words, listen to him. You've heard the law. You've heard the voice of the prophets. Now listen to Jesus, my son. That was very profound. And that would have radically changed this thinking of those three disciples. When the disciples heard this, we read, they fell on their faces and were terrified. Everyone who's come into the presence of glory has been terrified. Remember Jesus said to Moses, to see me, to see my face, you can't live, you'll die. Because we are unable to absorb that kind of glory. When Moses came down from receiving the Ten Commandments, he, he shone with a glory that the children of Israel couldn't handle. And so he wore a veil to protect them from seeing the glory because they couldn't deal with it. The other nar interesting narrative is that when you're talking about law and you're talking about the prophets is another example that happened on the road to Emmaus. Jesus had been crucified and the two disciples were walking away from Jerusalem. They'd seen the rigors and horror of persecution, of brutality, of injustice and of, of crucifixion. And you and I will probably do the same, is just move away, get out. Emmaus is about seven miles out of Jerusalem. And they were walking, feeling rather downcast, when a friendly stranger, the Lord Jesus Christ, whom at that time they didn't know, befriended them. And they expressed their disappointment, their loss, their perplexity, their confusion. They had hoped that the Messiah would have restored the kingdom to Israel, so to speak. And... Listen to the conversation. What actually happens? I'll turn to um, Luke 24, verse 25. After hearing the disciples express their disappointment, he's, the Lord says to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart, Luke 24, verse 25, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Verse 26, he asked the question, Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And then the Lord does something different. Interesting. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in the scriptures the things concerning himself. So the voice of the Lord in the Old Testament 
through the Torah, the law and the prophets, is the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us make man in our image and our likeness, the oneness of the Father and the Son speaking at creation. And the ancients didn't understand that. That's why Jesus said to his disciples, you're privileged to hear and to see what those who went before you didn't. So the Lord started with Moses through the law, through the prophets, to show how those scriptures pointed to the Christ. So we see the lawgiver and the Lord of prophecy in the Messiah Jesus Christ. Now this also comes out in a heated exchange in John chapter 5, I think it's verse 39, between Jesus and the Pharisees. The Pharisees were very biblically literate. They could recite Torah, the first five books of the Bible. They understood the prophets. They, they had spent their life immersed in the scriptures. And then Jesus says something to those learned Pharisees who ended up killing Jesus. John chapter 5, verse 39, he said, You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. So we can spend a lifetime studying the Bible, reading the Bible, trying to live by every commandment and believing that we can achieve eternal life that way. But Jesus said to those who did that, of the scriptures, it is they that bear witness about me. So all the scriptures the Pharisees were studying, the law and the prophets, Jesus said, these scriptures bear witness about me. And then he said, your problem, Pharisees, is that you refuse to come to me that you may have life. So Christianity is not being about religious, doing certain things to earn merit points. It's about coming to Jesus. It's about relationship. And from that relationship, righteousness of Christ is formed in us, where we live obediently by every word of God. I hope you find this inspiring and encouraging as we immerse deep. Because brothers, you are pastors, you are teachers, and God is equipping us to work together as a body to bless and encourage and equip and strengthen those he's given us so that we may be rightly anchored in the, the Son of God in, as a, a, a branch is rooted into the vine. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. And that's our reality. So, the, just like Jesus pointed out to those Pharisees that they could not see the Messiah. Why? Because they were spiritually blind. They were looking at the Word of God and couldn't see the Son of God or the Word of God personified. Um, Jesus says, you know, in another exchange, a few verses on, John chapter 5, verse 46, he says, For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. It makes it a very interesting study to study the first five books of the Bible and understand the depth of messianic reference and how the Lord spoke and dealt with, with, with the first humans, Adam and Eve, how the Lord spoke to, to Noah, how the Lord spoke with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and, and, and the whole narrative with ancient Israel being select and failing to keep the law because the lacking the Holy Spirit, etc. And Jesus says, this is all about me. And when we come to understand that, it's like scales falling from our eyes. The more we study the scriptures, the more we see Jesus Christ revealed. I want to give you a reference because um, Psalm 103 speaks of the Lord. Bless the Lord in verse 2. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases. Now the Pharisees understood that it's the Lord who forgives us, the Lord who heals us. And what was the signature of Jesus' ministry? Jesus healed people of the infirmities. He forgave people of sin. And he also raised people from dead, from death from the tomb. See, Job references that. Job says, if a man dies, shall he live again? All the days of my service I would wait till my renewal would come. You would call and I would answer you and you would long for the work of your hands. 
Job knew that the Lord would call him from the grave. So what does Jesus do? Lazarus, come out! And a certified dead man of four days walks alive from his tomb. In fact, in John chapter 5, verse 28, Jesus says, All who are in their graves will come out when they hear the voice of the Son of God and live when they hear his voice. That's why we are a Christ-centered church. Because the whole biblical narrative is Christ-centered, Messiah-centered, salvation-centered. So the very fact that Jesus healed, resurrected, gave sight to the blind, forgave sins, is a powerful starting point as we open our eyes to the glory that's before us, where those prophets of old just didn't see it. That was given it to them and they recorded it for our benefit for future generations. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And you and I, in different languages, in different cultures, in different circumstances, different parts of the world and different time zones, we are the body of Christ that Jesus is building. And we are called collectively and individually into a deep, covenant personal relationship with Jesus Christ and um, we are the body of Christ in fact we are known as the church of God seventh day because the scripture refers in the first century as those who lived according to the way became the church of God or the churches of God but collectively as Paul was saying goodbye in his chapter 16 of Romans and giving farewell and different greetings to different households in Rome, he writes in Romans chapter 16, verse 16, greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. So there's one singular reference when Paul looked at all the body of Christ together and calls them the churches of Christ. Paul wrote to those at Corinth and he says, as for Titus, he was a young Maha pastor, he is my partner and fellow worker for your benefit. And as for our brothers, they are messengers of the churches, the glory of Christ. So the glory of Christ is the work that he's doing, the brothers and sisters together that form the body of Christ, that the churches of Christ, the church of God, the church of God seventh day, the brothers that are all of us together form this, the glory that reflects the risen Christ. Now, my favorite book of the Bible if I can make a confession, is the Gospel of John. John takes us right down into the personal identity of Christ. In fact, in the second last chapter, he, he gives you the reason why he wrote. He said, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that by believing you may have life in his name. Very powerful reason for writing. And John takes us into the person and the identity of Jesus Christ. And John begins with the way the Torah begins. In the beginning. But John takes us deeper and much deeper. But he also refers and references to the creation. John chapter 1 verse 1. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God. And the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. So we go back to Genesis. And God said, let us make man in our image and our likeness. There's the us and our evident in the singular voice of God, the Father and the Son. Not yet made manifest the mystery of the ages until the Christ event. All things were made through him, the reference to creation, and without him, not anything that was made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. Let's go down to verse 9 of John chapter 1. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. That takes us back to the Genesis account. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. So the the Hebrew people, the children of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Jesus came to his own. Those who knew Torah, those who knew scripture, who knew the prophets. But they denied Jesus Christ. In fact, they crucified him. But to all who did receive him, in verse 12, 
who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. As John says elsewhere, that you may believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So not only was this John's central message, it was Apostle Paul's central message, Christ and him crucified. The price that Jesus prayed in his blood for our redemption, our life, our salvation. Verse 13, who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. That's referring to Jesus Christ, born of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. John uses the word logos, the word which in the Greek language of that day was the highest form of intellect, understanding, personification, anything that you could aspire to of the highest level. And John uses that to reach and to identify the Son of God as the Word of God spoken at creation. The Word of God thundered in Mount Sinai in the Ten of Commandments, personified in Christ, and the Word of God written into our very hearts. And we have seen His glory, the glory of the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. If you have to write an epitaph for someone, you choose your words very carefully. John describes Jesus in just three words, four words, full of grace and truth. Hold that thought because we'll come back to it shortly. What we explore is coming to understand the nature of our salvation, the nature of our calling, the nature of our equipping, the identity that identifies us as children of God and recognizing the redemptive price, the blood of Jesus, paid on our behalf so that you and I have a testimony. You and I have the capacity then to go out and say, I am of Jesus Christ. He lived and died for me. He knew me before the foundation of the world. I have been bought with such an extraordinary price. The one who spoke everything into existence came and entered this world as a baby Jesus who died. And Jesus says, when I am lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. That's why we come to Jesus now. Because one day all people will be drawn to Jesus. And then Jesus will bring us to the Father. Very powerful and very encouraging. So you and I have a Christ-centered salvation. There's no other name under heaven by which men may be saved, said Peter. So therefore you and I have a Christ-centered testimony. What we say centers on the Lord Jesus Christ. You and I have a Christ-centered hope. A hope that one day we will hear the voice of the Son of God calling us from this earthly grave to raise us to immortality because of the Holy Spirit. And we have a Christ-centered glory. You know, Moses had a glory when he came down from Mount Sinai. But it was a glory that was veiled. He had to wear a covering because the carnal-minded children of Israel could not handle and deal with the glory. It was too confronting. But Jesus beckons us with an unveiled glory, a glory that we can behold the Son of God and understand. When Jesus was crucified, remember the tabernacle or the temple had the Holy of Holies? And only once a year, the high priest could enter the Holy of Holies. And in the Holy of Holies, he would sprinkle the blood once on the mercy seat, etc. When Jesus was crucified and died, that big, heavy blocking off veil, symbolizing separation from God to humanity, was torn from top to bottom. So people in the temple could look in to the Holy of Holies, which had never happened before. And the symbolism of this act alone, as Jesus says, I will draw all people to myself. We have access to our Father now in the name of Jesus. Very powerful. So we behold the glory of the Lord with an unveiled, whereas Moses' glory had to be veiled. Jesus speaks to us that we may know who we are, And we know who the Father is and we know how our relationship to the Father is through Jesus Christ. John chapter 14, 20, Jesus says, In that day you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. You know what that means? Jesus is one with the Father. 
And Jesus invites us to be one with him. I in you and you and me, just as Jesus is one in the Father. And this new covenant relationship that we are invited to is what the law and the prophets point to. The kingdom of God, the reality of having a personal covenant relationship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords forever and ever. The new covenant, as opposed to the old covenant, is quite different. The old covenant was written on tablets of stone and externally governed a carnal people, like the Ten Commandments. The new covenant, written in Jesus' blood, is written on our hearts. So our very nature is changed. So that we become image bearers of Jesus Christ in whom there was no sin. So rather than having the old covenant as external regulations, now the very same message is written into our hearts, totally transformed into image bearers of Jesus Christ. So Christianity is not about being religious or doing a religion. It's about a relationship that's totally transformative with our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. So the Church of God, Seventh Day, historically finds its place and identity today more clearer than ever with the Son of God, Jesus Christ. The law leads us to Christ and Christ leads us to our Heavenly Father. So what do we look like? How does the Church of God look like? What, where do we draw our clues? Paul writes to those at Thessalo- Thessalonica and Greece. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14. For you, brothers, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. The churches of God in Christ Jesus. So we are known as the Church of God, Seventh Day. And what we should understand is that we are identified as a church of God in Christ Jesus. Now, the book of Revelation explores that a little bit further, that the saints who collectively make up the body of Christ, the church of God, are those who keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus. The commandments of God are not external regulations under the old covenant. No, the commandments of God are internalized, that we live by every word of God, transforming our character completely, and we hold on to the testimony of Jesus. Jesus' words become our words. His purpose becomes our purpose. His will, because of the Father, becomes our will and our direction and our motivation. So what does this church look like? How does it behave? What are the the ingredients or the key ingredient that makes it up? Paul wrote to those at Colossae, Colossians 3.17, and he instructs the church, whatever you do, In word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. So can I ask you, brothers, do we do everything that we say and everything we do, and may I add everything we think, in the name of the Lord Jesus? Because there was a time in my life when I didn't. I did everything what seemed right to me. But scripture says there's a way that seems right to a man that leads to death. Whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Wow, that is transformative. And I pray that everything we say and everything that we do is in the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is coming again as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But until he does, he said, I will never leave you I will never forsake you. I won't leave you as orphans. He said, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. So as you gather together for this pastoral meeting in Nepal, and I'm here in Western Australia, we are united. Jesus Christ is in our midst, counselling, encouraging, affirming, strengthening, providing for us, guiding us, and helping us to see the task that lies ahead in sharing the words of life into the greater society. Jesus calls us in a very personal, deep level, but he also calls us into community, into faith community. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. If you want to eat, you're not going to find life elsewhere. He says, 
I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. Who else could say that? But the Son of God, who can raise the dead and give sight to the blind. Who says, if, you, if I'm in you by the Holy Spirit, you will live forever. That's why we as a church community, once a year, commemorate and celebrate and proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And part of our celebration is taking a small piece of unleavened bread, symbolizing the broken body of Jesus, body of Jesus Christ, as a symbol of Christ in us. He who is in you, said John, is greater than he who is in the world. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. That's why Jesus Christ is Saviour. He gave his life so that men may be saved. John chapter 15, Jesus says, Abide in me and I in you. That's our reality. Listen to his words. As a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. Apart from Jesus Christ, we are the walking dead. That's what Jesus described the, the Pharisees as, as whitewashed sepulchres, whitewashed tombs. Jesus says, apart from me you can do nothing. Then the word of caution. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away like a branch and withers. And the end result is, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. Gone forever. When Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing, that's a, a calling to you and me individually. It's a calling and responsibility to us as a church collectively. And it's the reality and the heart and core of our success or our failure, abiding in Christ, the central pillar of our faith, the central pillar of our testimony. In John chapter 17, Jesus re John recorded Jesus' prayer before his suffering. And there's three parts to this prayer. First, Jesus prays for himself. Second, he prays for his immediate disciples. And the third area of his prayer, he prays for all those who would follow. And we pick this up in John chapter 17, verse 20. Jesus prays, he says, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, I am are in me and I in you. So there's the oneness of Jesus with the Father re-established. Again, reiterated I mean. That they may also be in us so that the world may believe that you've sent me. The power of unity and oneness and love for one another is the greatest witness that we could ever have. And we are called to love one another as we have been loved. We must understand just how much, brothers, we have been loved. The price that's been played for our redemption in Jesus Christ. Verse 22 of John chapter 17. The glory that you've given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. Ideally on this earth, the greatest we come to oneness is the ideal marriage between a husband and wife, that are Christ-centered relationship, that are one. The Lord doesn't see a man and a woman together in marriage as two. The Lord sees us as one flesh, no longer two. The Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ are one. And then Jesus Christ invites us into himself as one. That's why Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. On the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, Jesus says, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. And Jesus was referring to the Holy Spirit. I in them, that they may be one, even as we are one. In verse 23, I in them, and you in me, that they may become perfectly one. That's what we are to be as the body of Christ. The Church of God, seventh day. The kingdom of God in microcosm, in one. With one Lord, one faith, one salvation. So the world may know that you've sent me, and love them as you have loved them. Father, now this is a reference to Jesus' glory. Jesus doesn't want his glory to be veiled. 
like the mosaic veiledness of the glory that Moses carried in him. John chapter 17, verse 24. Father, I desire that they also, whom you've given me, may be with me where I am to see my glory that you've given me because you've loved me before the foundation of the world. Jesus often references himself before his earthly ministry. Father, restore to me the glory I had with you before the world was. He said to the Pharisees, before Abraham was, I am. And he says, because you've loved me before the foundation of the world. Long before the world was spoken into existence, the Father and the Son were one. The Heavenly Father and manifest now as the Lord Jesus Christ. We're invited into fellowship, into communion. Elsewhere, Jesus says, we will come, the Father and Son, we will come and make our home with him in covenant, in relationship, in fellowship. So we have a Christ-centered testimony because we have a Christ-centered salvation and therefore we have a Christ-centered joy and a Christ-centered glory. That's why we are a Christ-centered church. The center of all the scriptures point to the story of salvation, progressive revelation of the good work of God is doing in Jesus Christ. The law leads us to Christ. Paul expounds this in his letter that he wrote to the Galatians. Galatians chapter 3, verse 24. Therefore the law was our tutor, or our guardian, to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. The law is not external like a teacher on us. The law is now internalized. And then in Jesus Christ leads us to the Father. This becomes apparent in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 28. We, something tra Jesus refers to a transcendent reality that has not yet in its fullness happened. When all things are subjected to him, that's to Jesus Christ, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection unto him, that God may be all in all. That is something we yearn and look forward to. And we're on the journey to that. When Jesus, who everything was put under subjection under him, takes everything and brings it under subjection to the Father, and we are ushered into the Father's presence. The mystery of the ages and the mystery for the ages is revealed in Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ. That's why he's called Lord Jesus Christ. And we experience that today in a close, an enduring fellowship, in a close and enduring relationship, in a close enduring covenant. Very powerful. So where do we go from here? The author of the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, we break into a thought. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And how do we do that? Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Fix your eyes on Jesus, in other words. The Apostle John addresses this reality. He says, and he, and, he, and he extends this invitation for fellowship, for communion, for oneness. He says, 1 John 1 verse 3, That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you. This is our testimony, because this is what we've experienced. So that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed... Our fellowship is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. So that's why the apostles always began their letters, grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace, unmerited favour given to us through the blood of Jesus. So we have peace, peace made by the blood on the cross. Grace and peace to you from God the Father. And the apostles could say that because they had fellowship and the fellowship they had was with God the Father and Jesus Christ in covenant. The message of 2,000 years ago is a powerful testimony for us today to continue to understand, to faithfully live, to embrace the suffering that we are called to in the name of Jesus, to glorify him. Father, brothers, we've been called to ministry. Whether you've been part of, of the, the body of Christ for many years or you're more recently one of the things that we've been entrusted 
Men will be brought to account for every idle word they speak. And we are commanded to be those who speak the very oracles of God. Peter refers to this in 1 Peter 4 verse 10. And I want to leave this with you as we draw to a close now. As each one has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks the oracles of God. So brothers, we need to be familiar with the trunk of the tree, which is Jesus Christ. He is the vine. We are the branches. We draw our life from Christ. And we have an identity, we have a purpose, and we have a glory that reflects to the, to the Son. And we give the Father thanks for that. Whoever speaks is one who speaks the oracles of God. Whoever serves, and we've been called as servants, we are slaves of Christ to speak his words, to do his will, and to pick up our cross and follow him. As one who serves by the strength that God supplies. Remember Paul said, I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. In order that in everything, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. We're invited as children of God, as joint heirs of Jesus Christ, but the glory rests on Jesus and his preeminence. The preeminence of Christ will be forever and ever and ever. And you and I are invited as pioneers of this salvation with a testimony. Brothers, may we reflect the light of Jesus Christ in this world. May we love sacrificially, to love as we've been loved. May we serve faithfully. May we have a clear and strong testimony. And may we reflect the grace and the truth of Jesus Christ. Some of us have come from a grace, more Protestant background, and we've been short on truth. Some of us come from a more fundamental background where we held on to truth like the Pharisees and been short on grace. Jesus calls us to be full of grace and truth because he was full of grace and truth. May we, as a part of the body of Christ, reflect this greater glory and I look forward to the time when Jesus calls us from the grave. Brothers, we have work to do and may God strengthen us by the power of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. It's been a wonderful time of being able to share with you and I hope you, this message is of some encouragement and some strength. I am looking forward to travelling to Nepal one day but I also look forward to being guest, having you as guest here in Western Australia. But wherever we are, May God strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, and provide for us. And when we soon get together, I believe in November, for the Zone 4, Zone 6 meeting of the International Ministerial Congress, by God's grace, I hope to see some of you there. Take care, and in the name of Jesus Christ, may God bless you all.